This is the Digital Factory Podcast. I'm John Bruner. Today we'll be talking about digital assembly, going beyond just 3D printing a part into thinking about how you can use adhesives to create entire assemblies out of 3D printed parts with the mechanical characteristics that you need. But first we have a very special announcement. The Digital Factory Conference is coming to Munich on May 14. After the first Digital Factory at MIT last summer, we heard from a lot of you that you wanted us to bring the program to Europe. So we're holding our next conference at the Technical University of Munich with companies that are leaders in digital manufacturing. We've got speakers like the CTO of GE Europe, the lead for additive manufacturing production at BMW, the CTO of Materialize, and the head of IoT and digital supply chain at SAP. You'll find the entire speaker lineup at digitalfactory.xyz, and we're adding speakers all the time. Use the code PODCAST to get a 5% discount when you register. Again, visit digitalfactory.xyz and use the code PODCAST for a 5% discount. If you're intrigued by our discussion about digital assembly in this podcast episode, you'll want to join us on May 14. One of the keynote presenters is Jerry Perkins, colleague of today's guest and the North America president of Henkel, the German company that's a leader in specialty adhesives. He'll offer a vision for how additive manufacturing, chemistry, and automated assembly all come together. My guest today is Michael Todd. He's the head of innovation and new business development at Henkel. Michael, it's great to have you on. Well, thank you for having me. This is a great opportunity. So a lot of our listeners who are interested in 3D printing and additive manufacturing probably haven't given a lot of thought to adhesives as part of their process. So why are we talking about adhesives and 3D printing? Yeah, you know, that's probably one of the first questions we always hear is, uh, why would Hinkle, an adhesives company, be um, involved in 3D printing or additive manufacturing? And, and the key here is that the materials which we develop, we actually have a, a wide range of adhesives, sealants, and coatings that go into various industrial applications. We find that these same materials that would be used in, uh, in another type of manufacturing process ultimately find their way also into bonding, sealing, finishing, additive manufactured parts. For example, a company developing parts in additive manufacturing, perhaps there's a need because of build space or build volume to uh, have multiple parts which are printed. And uh, sometimes they're mechanically joined or sometimes they're bonded. And so uh, we actually stepped into this business because we had so many customers coming to us and saying, uh, hey, we've got these uh, 3D printed parts, how do we bond them together? How do we make them mechanically robust for uh, industrial applications? And then once we got into that space, we realized it wasn't only bonding, it was sealing, it was filling porosity. There's all kinds of uh, polymer materials that we uh, typically develop for other applications, which end up finding their way then into these uh, additive manufactured applications uh, after the parts have been printed. Bonding, uh, as you point out, is is something that gets really interesting uh, in the context of 3D printing. It's a question we get at Formlabs all the time from users who are getting into, you know, more advanced applications. Uh, 3D printing, of course, usually doesn't involve very large build volumes. It's it's really rare to find machines that can print larger than, say, a foot cubed. Um, and a lot of people see this as a limitation. So being able to print multiple pieces and then bond them together really increases the uh, the versatility of what you can do, gives you a yeah. lot of design freedom. Yeah, exactly, and that's what our customers are finding. And, and by the way, even sometimes, as you mentioned, it could be a, a build volume constraint, or, or maybe it's different polymer materials that are being um, developed as well. So if you have a, a typical uh, UV cure or SLA type of machine, um, of course the types of materials that are being produced in that machine are quite different than a typical um, a powder centering SLS type of machine. So what happens when a customer has two different materials coming off of two different 3D printing machines and they want to bond them together? That's usually, the, by the way, the first question we get. We have dissimilar mm. materials. We've tried to glue. It sticks on one. It doesn't stick on the other. So how do we address that problem? And by the way, we love that question. That's exactly <laughs> the, the types of challenges that, that we're going after in our business. 
Have you seen customers um, getting into uh, you know interesting designs that involve an adhesive as a mechanical component? Maybe they're 3D printing a couple of rigid components and uh, and creating a, a flexible join between them. Yeah, we've seen this because, for example, people are using different types of elastomers, polyamides, some of the new silicone materials that are coming out for 3D printing. And usually, especially these softer materials, unless you're developing something like an O-ring, um, they're typically not a standalone part. They they need to form um, a functional part of a larger device. And so that's exactly the types of applications that we're seeing that uh, our customers are having challenges with about bringing these dissimilar materials together. And actually, there's one other element there which you may have um, been thinking about as well, and that is if you uh, print a even a rigid mechanical part on a typical 3D printer, the types of polymers that are used in adhesives can be quite structurally uh, strong, uh, robust. Mm -hmm. um, using these same polymer materials, for example, as a coating on the surface of a printed part, um, even a thin uh, coating can impart quite a bit higher durability uh, and sometimes mm. other properties, you know, surface finish, even flame retardancy are some areas that we've been exploring by applying thin adhesive coatings onto the surface of the parts so that we can dramatically change the properties then of that part. That's another thing that, uh, that, that people talk about as they get deeper into additive manufacturing. One of the first concerns that people often have as they get into 3D printing is that maybe the surface finish or the, you know, the look and feel of a part isn't exactly what they would want for an end use part, especially that that's going out to consumers. And then you look at the, the wide variety of, of finishes that you can apply and things that you can do to improve the surface finish that are still easier than whatever you would have to do in, in a conventional manufacturing process. That, that's exactly where we're trying to bring some new properties, new performance uh, using surface treatments into these parts. Um, you know, we sell adhesives into such a wide variety of industrial applications. Um, we have products that go into semiconductor and electronics manufacturing, into optical displays, into medical uh, spaces. And so you realize these materials, these polymer systems, have already been developed specifically to impart certain properties for certain markets. And simply put, we can take that same learning and now apply it to the, uh, the adhesives and coatings that we can put into the 3D printed parts that are going into those same types of applications. So it's not often that I get to sit down with an adhesives uh, scientist, and, and you have a, a PhD in material science, right? I do. So originally I started my uh, education uh, in uh, organic chemistry and, and interestingly enough found my path into polymer chemistry and, and material science. And, and I think if you ask most people walking down the street, uh, you know, what's a polymer scientist? <laughs> they really have no idea. But it's been a fascinating career. I've spent almost 20 years here in uh, Henkel uh, developing adhesives. Originally, I came from the automotive industry. So I worked for several years um, in Detroit uh, in design of components for automotive applications. And it's actually during that time that I first learned of Henkel and the Loctite branded products. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then I went from uh, being the customer to being the designer and, and uh, material scientist in, in Henkel. And I worked in automotive, in aerospace, in electronics. And, and now I lead an overall team for developing uh, advanced material systems, uh, polymer formulations for a wide variety of applications. So there's a staggering variety of adhesives and formulations. Can you explain something about the process of developing a new adhesive? Are there adhesive uh, scientists who, you know, strictly work on silicone-based adhesives, others who work strictly on epoxies? How, how different um, are these different families of adhesives in terms of how they're developed and, and how they're, uh, you know, produced? Yeah, the, the, the chemistry behind the various types of adhesives is quite different. And, um, and so you find, uh, especially in the markets that we serve, specialists that have a, a deep technical knowledge about specific chemistries. And, and that's a real advantage. But also, on the other hand, one of the values that we believe we bring to the market is we typically consider ourselves chemistry agnostic. Hmm. And what I mean by that is through, through years and years, we've been developing adhesives uh, for 80 or 90 years. Um, we've developed during that time uh, pretty deep te technical know-how in most traditional and maybe some non-traditional uh, polymer systems that are used in adhesives. 
So what we'd like to say is when we go to a customer, we're, we're not looking to solve a problem with an epoxy or with a silicone. Rather, we're just looking at what are the material properties that are needed in order to address a, an issue that a customer has. And, and that really gives us, I think, a, a real strong position to be able to go to the customer and say, okay, just first, let's look at your part, let's look at your application. Depending on the environment, depending on the mechanical requirements, then we start to figure out what types of chemistries that we apply to it. So how often um, in the world of sort of specialty adhesives, uh, industrial adhesives, things that you guys are making for the automotive industry or the electronics industry, how often are, uh, are the requirements met by just an off-the-shelf adhesive um, versus you know, a deeply customized process? I guess it would make my life really easy if, uh, if these were standard <laughs> products. Um, realistically, that almost never happens. Hmm. Uh, and as an example, I, I've spent uh, more than a decade in the uh, electronics and semiconductor materials space. And I can say in that part of our business anyways, uh, probably the majority, uh, far more than 50% of the products that are sold to our major customers are designed and developed and sold exclusively to one customer, usually just for one application. Hmm. So it's really that specific. We, we call it mass customization, meaning in a way the same thing that we try to do or you try to do with 3D printing, which is give the customers the ability to um, self-design their parts. In reality, we're working with our customers on the adhesive side and customizing uh, the materials to fit their applications. And it really helps them. It, it allows them to have a, a much wider design space, uh, design freedom in the, the applications that they're tackling if they don't have to just stay with a, a very limited range of material properties of a standard adhesive off the shelf. What are the major uh, requirements that a customer typically comes in with? Is this a matter of specifying strength and elasticity and then uh, you go and formulate it or, or are there just a ton of different requirements that all go into this? Yeah, I mean, it goes so wide. Um, honestly, it's, it's strength. Typically, people are using adhesives, obviously, to make a mechanical bond. So almost always, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, but then again, working directly with our customers, we start asking questions. And uh, I think of it as peeling back the onion. You, you just keep asking and asking and asking, and then you find out, well, it's mechanical, but it's also some effect of vibration and toughness. Uh, maybe there's uh, a humid environment or it's exposed to certain types of uh, chemicals in, in, in the use. Uh, maybe there's weight constraints and we have to think about uh, composites. It, it really is amazing as you uh, get into the customer's design phase, how many different properties could be of value, even sometimes they don't think about it, and that would allow them additional design flexibility. For example, if you could make the material conductive. If I could only have it conductive, then I could change my design. So it really is, is a very, very wide range. And again, linking this back to additive manufacturing, to me, this is the opportunity to bring that customization to um, the world of, of 3D printing and additive manufacturing. If you've, if you've got a part, and of course you have certain design limitations uh, with build space, but the whole idea of additive manufacturing is to give the freedom of design like we've never had before. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can couple that with design of material properties like we've never had before, honestly, it's it's unbelievable how creative I think people will become when you've taken away the constraint of only a limited number of material properties and also, of course, the limited design that traditionally comes with uh, machining or injection molding. Yeah, and the and the constraints involved in adding mechanical fasteners to assemblies, right? You look at oh, the difference sure. in in uh, in an assembly that has to reserve, uh, you know, bosses and holes and so on for mechanical fasteners compared to something that could be glued very effectively with just the right properties. I'm sitting here during our interview and looking at my mobile phone on the on the table, and, and you realize, by the way, if you look at this, that you can't see any seams, you don't see any fasteners. Um, the companies that manufacture these devices have become very, very good at finding the very smallest areas to bond between the glass, between the mechanics, uh, all the functions, the buttons, the speakers, the cameras. It's amazing how much is being bonded in a device like this. And again, it gets them design flexibility that would never previously have been possible if they were looking to mechanically fasten all these parts together. 
So can you talk about some of the special issues in, uh, in developing adhesives for 3D printed parts? As you mentioned, there's a really wide variety of materials that people are using in 3D printing. Uh, you have sort of methacrylates for uh, stereolithography and, uh, you know, nylon in the, in the powder bed fusion machines, some exotic uh, metals and ceramics and stuff like that. How do you address the need to, to bond all of those? Well, case by case, so similar to the way we would approach uh, any other industrial application. And, and, and by the way, let me, let me be careful here to say that where we see the, the real um, growth opportunity and especially high value opportunity is in uh, bonding and sealing industrial parts. Maybe not as attractive for us is, is bonding a toy, um, mm -hmm. but when you get into industrial parts where the designers are, are creating something that needs to have very specialized high performance characteristics, this is exactly where our materials come into play. So the, the real challenges typically are um, exactly the same as in the applications we normally serve, and that is almost never are you bonding two or three materials of the same geometry and the same um, requirements from one application to another. So as we spoke earlier, some of the applications where we bond a methacrylate or some kind of acrylic-based chemistry to, for example, a polyamid, that is not as easy as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. You have really different mechanical properties, different coefficients of thermal expansion, different polarities on the surface. Um, by the way, some 3D printing processes can leave residues on the surface that can impact um, the, uh, the bonding as well. So the challenges are, are multiple fold, looking at the chemistry of what you've created, but also looking at the surface characteristics, the gloss, the residuals that might be on the part. These are all challenges. But again, it's not a lot different from going to a machine shop where you perhaps have oils on the surface of metal parts. Mm -hmm. And typically the customer says, look, you know, yes, of course, I'm going to try to clean it, but can I guarantee all the oil is off the part? Almost never. So we're also looking in our portfolio at other post-processing aids. We're looking at, at various types of cleaners, um, especially as we get more automated in 3D printing. Um, our customers and, and your customers are looking for ways to take the manual cleaning and, and uh, debonding off of the, the build plate. These things have to become more automated. We're looking at processing aids. We're looking at cleaners. We're looking at surface finishing agents that can all be used in line type of processes, which ultimately then enable us to be more creative with the adhesives that we can use. You've mentioned um, coatings as well a couple of times um, that they can improve, uh, you know, durability and some of the characteristics of, of what you're doing. Does it go deeper, uh, you know, chemically speaking, than just coating the outside of something and protecting it? Are these coatings actually sort of uh, penetrating and, and reacting and changing the characteristics of the parts? Yeah, they, they sure do. And, and you see this especially in sintering processes. So if you're looking at, at metal sintering or ceramics or some of the polymer sintering, you know that there's always some tendency for voids. And, and of course, depending on process, you can for sure optimize. But we actually have, um, for many years now, um, had products that go into uh, traditional metals um, manufacturing. So when, when you have a, a metal uh, part that's been cast molded, you almost always have some level of porosity in those castings. Uh, we've developed materials over the past decade or so that are used as impenetrants that go into those voids, um, into the cavities that are in a metal part and fill that space and effectively prevent leakage, prevent um, oxidation from happening. And now we're taking that same approach. If you look at a porous uh, ceramic or, or metal uh, centered 3D part, we're actually using almost exactly the same chemistry now to fill voids in that area as well. So we certainly see an opportunity not only to have it on the surface, but interior. And, and then, by the way, you may wonder, well, why? Who, who really cares if I have 1%, 2%, maybe even 5% porosity? Does it really hurt me? Mm -hmm. And the point is, it, depending on the application, the answer is yes. If you're really looking for an airtight seal, with one of these parts, um, the only way to, to ensure that that's really going to be airtight or impervious to solvents or fuels or other things is to fill those voids. So mm -hmm. we see a, a good opportunity there as well. So uh, um, I bet that uh, all of our listeners have at some point needed to seal something and in a pinch they've reached for a glue. So from, a, from an expert, is there a difference? What is the difference between an adhesive and a coating? 
Yeah, I think maybe two different things. One is an adhesive is usually between two surfaces. And so simply because of its uh, physical condition being sandwiched between two surfaces, we typically use different types of chemistries. Imagine if you're just applying the material and one surface is exposed to oxygen, now you have questions of oxygen inhibition. So all different types of chemistries have problems with oxygen inhibition, meaning that at the surface which is exposed to the oxygen, maybe you don't have as quick a cure or maybe not even a full cure. That can lead to things like tackiness or mm -hmm. um, optical imperfections on the surface. So a, an actual surface coating, maybe if you really get down into the basic chemistry, you might say, hey, these are pretty similar to a traditional adhesive. But in fact, they've been designed to be applied with one surface exposed. And that does, mm. um, it does mean that we have really a different design formulation for a, a type of surface, well, for a material that you know is only going to be used on a surface rather than uh, sandwiched between two products. This is really interesting. So what, what's the most uh, exotic application for an adhesive you've worked on or the most <laughs> difficult environment that an adhesive you've worked on has been used in? Well, you know... I don't know. The, the first thing that came to my mind when you said that was materials that go up into space. Um, mm -hmm. We've had uh, almost, well, I would imagine on, on every um, uh, space orbiting device, as well as things like the Mars rover, we have materials. Uh, I worked on a, a fun program, and, and we can't talk too much about details of the application, sure, but I can sure. tell you that on the Mars rover, there's there's our adhesives and sealants today. And, and what was fascinating about that was just imagining the heat that you're talking about the the durability requirements there were extraordinary mm -hmm. and uh and and sure enough you you put a a couple of real smart chemists in the lab and work with the engineers at, at nasa and they came up with materials that um i'm pretty sure are still there still functioning on on those devices so that, that was a, a pretty fun type of application that we see yeah i can't imagine the ultraviolet radiation as well going into into anything that's uh on Mars are going through space, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I mentioned the heat, but imagine the cold. So you're really going through absolute extremes. And, and there you're, you're looking at extreme um, mismatches in coefficient of thermal expansion. So toughness is important, elasticity. It's really an amazing environment. So where do you see, um, you know, adhesives and 3D printing going in the future? Is it is it just you know development of better adhesives to uh, to bond 3D printed parts, or are there ways that adhesives are going to get even more integrated in the 3D printing and, and additive process? Yeah, when we think about providing materials into other industrial spaces, we typically uh, use the phrase "total solutions," and what that means is that we're not only providing an adhesive. Uh, but typically we provide an adhesive, we provide also engineering support, and in some cases even we design and develop equipment to handle the application of the adhesive. So we want to be sure that we're providing this full service for uh, our customers. And, and we see this as an opportunity in, in 3D uh, printing space as well, as getting into engineering design capabilities and simulation, which is something that we do today in, in traditional manufacturing. Um, but also equipment. If there's opportunities, especially in, in post-processing areas, uh, bonding, uh, sealing, using our materials, but also using automated equipment to provide the speed needed for uh, advanced manufacturing of uh, 3D printed parts, we feel that that's a good space for us as well. You mentioned uh, simulation, and that's a huge part of the, you know, the future of digital manufacturing. Is it easy to simulate the performance of adhesives uh, you know, for engineering analyses? Well, you know, this has been done for quite some time. Is it simple? I would say absolutely not. <laughs> and by the way, I would say we're also in in our own organization, not the experts. We typically look to partner with uh, with companies that really have these expertise. And, and this is where a real partnership works as a win-win, because if we can work with uh, simulation software companies, hey, they're the experts in the, the CAD setup and, and the finite element analysis, but we're really the experts in the materials. And so we, we look to work hand in hand with uh, simulation companies in enabling them to better um, uh, predict the properties of the adhesives using the chemistry expertise from our side and of course the simulation expertise on their side. So I'd like to go into our uh, recurring segment, which is called Tools where I ask the guest about his or her favorite tool. 
So, Michael Todd, let's hear about your favorite tool. <laughs> well, maybe it's no surprise, perhaps, my, my favorite tool when it comes just to thinking about a project that I had this weekend was, was a glue. <laughs> um, you know, if you go to the hardware store, I'm sure sometimes you're, you're dumbfounded when you look at the racks and wonder, wow, all these glues, do I pick a cyanoacrylate, do I pick a epoxy, how about a hot melt? Mm -hmm. and, and I'll be honest with you, they all have their applications. There's one that I have in my toolbox, which I use all the time. And uh, it's actually a, a general purpose glue. It's something that uh, was developed uh, here in Hinkle a few years ago. And it's a, a combination of two different chemistries. So it has a cyanoacrylate type of quick cure, but also a, a longer term a mechanical cure mechanism in, in the hmm. single material. Uh, and it's called 60 second all purpose glue. Um, and it's I love right it in the title. <laughs> Yep, it's right in the title. It's quick, um, but it's also durable. And uh, I found that it works on a wide variety of applications. And I'll be the first to say, as a, as a longtime adhesives uh, developer, I guess probably there'll never be one adhesive that works on everything. But uh, this one around the house, I love it. It works. That's extremely helpful. I've, I, I've stood in front of the rack of adhesives, and I bet that everyone listening to this podcast has also stood in front of the rack of adhesives. And you know, been concerned that their application is just outside of what's described on the package. So it's helpful to have a, a recommendation from an expert on the uh, the one size fits all home glue. Yeah, and now of course every all of your listeners when they uh, they have that challenging application, they can send us an email too. <laughs> we can help them. <laughs> Excellent, Michael. If uh, if listeners want to find you online, what's the best way? So www.henkel.com. And it's a uh, opportunity there to get um, guides on bonding. Of course, you can see catalogs, but maybe the best part of that is the online chat. If you've got a, a question uh, real quick that you need answered, this is the best way to do it. And we've got experts all the time manning those uh, responses. So that if you're bonding two materials, they'll, they'll give you a quick recommendation. Excellent. All-purpose adhesive expertise. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, Michael Todd, Head of Innovation and New Business Development at Henkel. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you very much. This has been great. Remember to check out the Digital Factory Conference. It's an essential event for leaders in digital manufacturing. Whether you're interested in 3D printing or advanced automation or AI on the factory floor or intelligent supply chains or connected machinery, you'll find answers and you'll find experts and you'll find frameworks for understanding these technologies in the context of your business at the Digital Factory Conference. Visit digitalfactory.xyz and use the code podcast for a discount. Remember, that's digitalfactory.xyz and use the code podcast for a discount. Thanks again for joining us. I hope to see you in Munich on May 14th. For the Digital Factory, I'm John Bruner.